Okay, so let's go ahead and let's turn in our Bibles to Luke 18. And today I'm going to be talking about America and the Great Reset and uh, the need to fight for the destiny of America that, that's in God's heart. So I know uh, we opened up last Sunday with this very same scripture, but I, I, just, want to keep, I just want to keep encouraging us right now. Um, I know we all need encouragement. If you're like me, you have been this kind of roller coaster of emotion where, you know, you're, you, you know, one moment you're like ecstatic that it's going to happen. God's going to bring justice. The next moment you're like, woe is me. Our country's gone. So I just wanted to start today by really, again, encouraging us out of Luke chapter 18. I, and I want to start by saying this, and I said it last, last Sunday, but I'm going I'm to say it again is that what should really define the way we think is not what we see in the media or hear in the media or hear all around the world saying this thing's over. What should define us is the word of Jesus. Because he gives us a, a, a promise. God has the final word in what happens in this nation. And again, we, he, he says to us, Jesus tells the parable and he says that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. And I just want to, if I could do anything just to begin is say, I want to encourage us with everything we've got. Don't lose heart. Always pray. Pray until the end. I don't care how bleak it looks. Pray until the end. And he goes through, and we, we know the parable, but I just want to come down to, to verse 6. And the Lord's telling us a specific thing we should pray. And it has a lot of relevance to what we're going through right now in our country. Verse 7, Now will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? I want us, as we begin to be filled with more faith in what Jesus has said in this scripture than we are by what it looks like out there, than what it looks like in the media, that what it looks like by politicians and world governments, what it looks like by the pundits saying this thing's over, there's no way that the, uh, there's no way this thing's gonna be overturned. Is I want us to have more faith in what Jesus said that God will bring justice if his elect cry to him day and night. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Don't be discouraged. Don't quit. Don't give in to doubt. Don't give in to unbelief. Don't give in to any of those emotions. Don't lose heart. Always believe. Always believe. And pray. And pray. And pray and pray until the end for justice to be done. Amen? I just want to encourage us in that because today I want to talk about fighting for the destiny of America. We are literally in a battle for the destiny of America. I think we know that, but a lot of Christians just think, a lot of Americans and a lot of Christians just think, well, okay, we lost an election, but we'll get him in 2024. And we'll have a more presidential candidate then that can, you know, say nicer things on Twitter and he can, you know, have more polished speech and things like that. We'll get him in 2024. We don't know. If you feel that way, you have no idea what's going on right now in our nation. We are literally fighting for the destiny of America. We are literally fighting of whether we are going to be a constitutional republic or a socialist nation aligned with the global socialism agenda being pushed by the elite. It's not a normal election. It's not we'll get them in 2024. We're literally fighting for the constitutional republic. We're fighting for the destiny of a nation. And so this message, 
This message is, what I want to do in this message is I want us to have the proper perspective of the war that we are in. I want us to also discern the crossroads America is at. I want us to also sense God's will for America. And I want us to be filled with faith to pray to God that he will save our nation. My goal in this message is to present both the sober reality we are facing and also instill within you the faith, the courage, and the determination to fight until the end. And I'm going to start with sharing a story that happened yesterday. So me and Anna and John and Caleb, we went on a bike ride. It was like 68 degrees, beautiful. We went on a bike ride down Silver Comet, which is a, a paved road that goes from Georgia into Alabama. I mean, it was incredible. Uh, it was awesome. And so at the beginning of the, of the, uh, of the before we started, we, we told uh, Caleb, who's five, we told Caleb, we said, okay, Caleb, you're not going to be able to keep up with me and Anna because we have mountain bikes. We're going to go fast. And so me and Anna, we just started going out. And we're pedaling at our normal pace, going pretty fast. And if you don't know Caleb, this kid is the most competitive little kid I've ever seen in my life. And he's like, and especially with Anna. Anna's almost like his big sister. And he's like, no, ain't no way that girl's going to beat me. So here we are. Anna's out in front. I'm behind her. And, and, you know, I'm thinking, okay, they're way, way back there. All of a sudden, I hear these little pedals moving. And just keep in mind, Caleb has like... Uh, Caleb doesn't have a mountain bike. We have a mountain bike with gears, so you can, you can go into a higher gear, and it has more friction, so it causes, us, causes you to have to pedal less. But Caleb is just sitting here pedaling. And, the, I mean, just I'll never forget the image of this kid, you know, just going like this and this and this. And anyway, so Anna gets out there, and all of a sudden, Caleb passes me. And then, you know, I mean, he rode eight miles. A five-year-old kid rode eight miles on a bike. <laughs> Without gears, it's amazing. <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, it, it was because he was trying to compete with Anna. And so and when we were, we were done, he, he just collapsed, kidding around like he was so exhausted. But, you know, I'll never forget the image of these, this little, this, this five-year-old kid, the determination of the wills going around as fast as they can. And that got me. Caleb was so determined not to lose that he did whatever it took to win. And I would say that's the way we need to be right now in the battle we are facing. We need right now in the battle we are facing in America and in the world, we need a holy determination that says we cannot lose this battle. There are no what ifs. There are no we'll get them in 2024. There's none of that that we're facing here. Listen, the, 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 the very country of America is at stake right now. The very country as a constitutional republic, 244 years of history is literally at stake right now. Literally at stake. Jesus told the Pharisees and he said, he rebuked them. He says, you can tell the weather patterns. You can tell what's going to happen. But you cannot, you cannot discern the signs of the times. We literally are at a crossroads in this nation. We are facing the valley of decision in America. And I am calling for every intercessor to get on the wall and to fight like they ne have never fought before. We must have the determination to stand in the gap, no matter the price it cost us. We simply cannot lose this battle. We must know what is at stake. And so I'm going to talk to us about the bigger picture of what's going on. Because this is not about Trump versus Biden, Republican versus Democrat. It's way bigger than that. There is a conspiracy going on around the world. You can see it in Germany right now. I don't know if you've seen the, the news in Germany. There are riots breaking out because the government has said any, 
We, are, we, have the, we have the ability to go into any house, anything to impose freedom if you do not comply by our COVID laws. I mean, this, this, is, this whole thing is connected. What is happening in Germany is connected to what's happening in our country. In fact, it's written in Scripture. I want you to turn to Psalms chapter 2. And I just want to say, as, we, as you're turning there, Lord God, open our eyes. Open our eyes to what is happening right now in the world. This is probably going to shock some people, if you can stick with me. Because a lot of leaders in the body of Christ are not talking about this, sadly. Psalms chapter 2, David gives a prophetic declaration thousands of years before. And he says, why are the nations in an uproar? That word uproar, if you look at it in the Hebrew, can actually mean plotting a conspiracy. Why are the nations plotting a conspiracy? I'm not talking about a conspiracy theory. I'm talking about a conspiracy. Those are very different. The scriptures tell us at the end of the age, the nations are going to plot a conspiracy. Why are the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth. I would say in our modern terminology, the global elite, the technocrats who rule by their, their, their scientific knowledge, their, their specific knowledge they have, are taking their stand and the rulers are taking counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, which is Jesus Christ. And they're saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. In other words, they're saying, the elite are saying, we do not want a society or a culture that has anything to do with God. We want to take the word of God completely out of culture. We want to sever it from any influence that it has. The good news for us is verse 4. God, he sits in the heavens and he laughs. Our God is not moved right now. Our God is not moved by what's going on. He's not fretting. He's not nervous. And we shouldn't be either. We shouldn't have any fear. We should not have any anxiety about what's happening. God is laughing at what they're doing because he's in control. That doesn't mean everything that's going to happen is his will, but he is, he is in control. So let's talk about this. The, the, the plan for global socialism, what we're facing right now in our country and what we have been facing for the last four years the, the warfare we've been experiencing is about the global elite's plan to establish global socialism. Now, as I say this, I just want to say it like this. Do not come under a defeatist attitude when I share this, all right? I, I shared it with my wife and uh, my dad, and they're like, you're going to share that on Sunday? I said, uh, <laughs> I was planning to. Um, I am. And I actually cut out about half of it. But Andrew's like, well, make sure you give hope. You know, people need hope. And I completely agree. We need hope. And, we, and I, you know, I believe God is going to do something, okay? But I, I, we've got to know the battle we're truly facing. Because most Americans don't really know it. Most of the church, sadly, has no clue about it. It feels like, to me, the very same thing that was happening in Nazi Germany in the 30s as Hitler rose to power. And slowly the freedoms were taken away and slowly the liberty was removed until all of a sudden there's national socialism in Germany and all the freedoms are removed and Hitler has come to power. It feels like we're at the beginning of that around the world. And I believe it is part of end time prophecy for sure. So the, the question, so I, I just say it again, do not let this to put a defeatist attitude in you. Do not let it put fear in you. Rather, let it put in you a holy determination, like Caleb, like the story I shared, like Caleb, 
to fight against this through prayer and intercession. Amen? America is every, listen, just listen to this. And, and your first reaction would be probably to be like, no, that can't be true. But just listen. America is every bit at war right now as we were during the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and World War I and II. Just because we can't see planes, tanks, and soldiers right now doesn't mean we're not in the fight for our lives, because we are. And we must have, at this hour, in the body of Christ, an army of united intercessors who are going to intercede for God's will to be done to restrain the evil and minimize its effects. That is the need we have right now as we are in this battle, is we must have intercessors who are going to cry out to God for day and night for justice and not lose heart and not quit and not faint and not surrender and not get discouraged. We cannot get discouraged. We cannot give in to unbelief. We must rise up in prayer and intercession and war in the great battle we are facing right now as a nation. So I want to talk about, maybe you've heard about it, but I want to talk about the, the globalist plan for social, worldwide socialism. And so, Quentin, go ahead and show the first slide. These are, there's some, a few terms we need to get uh, familiar with. One of the terms is the, seven, the UN's 17 goals of sustainable development. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these right now, but I'm just going to highlight just a little bit. I, I want us to see what's really at stake, what we're fighting for, what's being pushed on us. The first one, the, the first, their first goal is that there would be no poverty around the world. Well, that sounds great, but what that really means is global wealth redistribution. What that means is not only will individuals who are wealthy be taxed, but nations will be taxed. What that means is that a country like America who is wealthy will be taxed so a country like Haiti could be, uh, become equalized. That's what that means. Sounds like utopia, but it's not. Number three, I'll just go through a few of these. Uh, good health and well-being. Well, that sounds awesome, right? I mean, who doesn't want good health and well-being? What this really means is socialized medicine which Lenin said, Vladimir Lenin said, he said that, that controlled health care or socialized medicine is the keystone of socialism. Number four, quality education. This means brainwashing our children. This means we no longer have a say of what our kids learn. This means the state can influence our kids in everything that's in accordance with the government. And this is not just the government of America. This is a worldwide government. This is what, uh, what, what is true about history, religion, sexual identity, sexual preference, racial inequality, human rights. You know, just whatever the global government says is true is going to be pushed upon our children, and we have no right to say no to it. That's what their plan is. Number 11. Sustainable cities and communities. What this means is the global elite want to move everyone from the rural and suburban areas into the city. Where you have large cities, which, which are called smart cities, driven by what's called the Internet of Things, meaning there's a device on every single thing, like a stove or an air conditioning unit or a shower or whatever, that is all monitored into the cloud so that it maintains sustainability and everything runs uh, smoothly. Uh, according to them, uh, powered by artificial intelligence, quantum computing, 24-7 surveillance, where you have no privacy and everything you do is closely monitored. Number 12, responsible consumption and production. What this means, without going into detail, what this means is what the World Economic Forum has said on their website, you are going to own nothing you're going to rent everything, and you're going to be happy. <laughs> Give me a break, and I'll show it in a minute. What it means, too, 
is they're going to take away your steak and your ribs and your Boston butts and your uh, pork and your turkeys. They're going to uh, uh, minimize the amount of meat you can eat for the good of your health and for the good of the environment. If that doesn't rise you up and, and rouse you up and cause you to fight, I don't know what else will. I mean, let's get some of these guys in Paulding County to realize, hey, the world government wants to take away your steaks and your ribs and your turkeys and see what happens. I, I mean, I'm, I think that, you know, we, they may not fight against some of the other stuff, but if their meat's being taken away, maybe they'll get into the fight. So the next term we want to know is uh, the UN's 2030 agenda. What that basically means is the UN has established a time frame for when these 17 goals of sustainability will be accomplished. In other words, their goal, they've set their goal on 2030. That is their plan. 2030 is their plan. Now the next term we need to get, uh, we need to get familiar, familiar with is the Great Reset. R raise your hand if you've heard of the Great Reset. Very important, very, very important. So let me just share this, even just to show you in, in uh, Time Magazine, Time Magazine, just in their November 2nd through November 9th article, Time Magazine did an article called The Great Reset. So this is not like a conspiracy theory, all right? This is out in the open. So the, the Great Reset by Time Magazine is out in the open. This is their plan. This is their plan for global government. So anyway, so the World Economic Forum is the one that is leading this up. The World Economic Forum, just think of the World Economic Forum as a, a, a global think tank or a, an organization that influences leaders to establish a global government. And, and, and especially as it relates to finances. So and there's, a, there's a, a tremendous amount of power in these guys. These are, these are very powerful organizations. Their goal is to weaponize the coronavirus in order to bankrupt many nations. This will lead to the elimination of personal property and a universal basic income. What you're seeing right now in Germany and what you're seeing right now in France is going to come to every nation because they want to bring down the economies of nations in order to establish the Great Reset, in order to, to completely redo the economy. And they're going to be gathering in 2021 in Davos, Switzerland to move this plan forward. That is why you're seeing what is happening right now in Germany. That is why you're seeing what's happening now even in France. That's why you're seeing in all these other nations where there's these strict lockdowns. That's why you're seeing it some in uh, democratically run demo uh, governments or where there's go democratic governors in this state and this nation. Is they're trying to weaponize the coronavirus to bring down economies so they can establish the Great Reset. Their goal is to weaken America. Their goal is to make the dollar no longer the reserve currency. Their goal is to shift to a new form of a worldwide economy. And so, Anyway, I don't know if you saw this, but Justin Trudeau, the prime minister of Canada, was even talking about this. So I'm just trying to say this is not a conspiracy theory. He was talking about this last week. This pandemic, he said, this pandemic has provided an opportunity for a reset. This is our chance to accelerate our pre-pandemic efforts to reimagine economic systems that address global challenges like extreme poverty, inequality, and climate change working back better methods, offering to back the most defenseless while keeping our energy on, a, uh, energy on arriving at the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the 17 Sustainable Goals. So this is not something, some, some guy in his mother's basement with a tinfoil hat on is trying to stir up. This is the world's elite. This is their plan. This is, what, this is the battle we're facing. This is why what has happened in the election has happened. The fraud, the takeover.
Because the, the elite have a plan, a great reset, and they are determined to make that happen. And so I'm, I'm not saying that to make us depressed or defeat us. I'm saying we've got to rise up with a fight right now to say whatever, we've got to stand in the gap like never before and fight and resist this plan. Amen? Amen. Just, just a couple more things. This slide here. The big slogan of those who want to establish the great, the great reset, of those who are, especially world leaders, is we want to build back better. Now, look at all the, the, lead, the leaders, world leaders are using that terminology. I don't want you to be deceived by that. Build back better means weaponize the coronavirus to bring in the great reset. And you see it even in Joe Biden. So that's their plan. That is their plan. You can go research this if you want. So, but that's their plan. In short, today's global elite want to establish a one world socialism governed by unelected technocrats, those, with, those who rule by specialized knowledge who will define the rules, the laws, the economy, the religion, and the culture. Now let's just look at a couple things that uh, the World Economic Forum, they released a video. This is their vision of what they want to establish. Look at this first one. <laughs> he does look pretty happy, I got to admit, but I'd take his white teeth as well. I mean, he's a nice looking guy. Maybe if, he's, if I looked like that, I'd be as happy as him. But here's what they're saying is, you will own nothing and you will be happy. <laughs> wow, that sounds like bliss to me, right? I mean, I'll own nothing and be happy, okay? So you're telling me how to be happy. Again, this is the World Economic Forum. This is on their video. This is not a guy in his mother's basement. This is real world leaders, their vision. The second thing is, whatever you want, you will rent, and it will be delivered by drone. So you're going to own nothing. The third one is the U.S. won't be the world's leading superpower. A handful of countries will dominate. See, America is going to be just one of many superpowers in this global alignment of nations. Here's the one I was just talking about. Is you're going to eat much less meat. Let that put a fight in you. Those deer you like, Howard, man, come on. <laughs> we need you fighting this intercessory battle here, man. They're going to take away your venison. <clears throat> An occasional treat, not a staple for the food, for the good of the environment or our health. Now, here's an article they wrote, and it was titled, Welcome to 2030. Fake smile. I own nothing, I have no privacy, and life has never been better. If you, if, you, if you want to read about what their plans are, you can just Google this very thing, that article title, World Economic Forum, Welcome to 2030, I Own Nothing, Have No Privacy, and Life Has Never Been Better. Okay, enough of the depressing stuff, all right? We're going to get into now, we're going to get into now the, the great need for America and Christians in the church to fight for our destiny. To fight for our destiny. And again, I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking about in, in war. I'm talking about in uh, spiritual warfare, in prayer and intercession. See, what we know now is we know that in time Babylon, Revelation 17 and 18 is rising up right now. All around the world. This is totally a global thing. It's not just what's happening in America. It's totally connected. America in the minds of the elite is in the way. America is in the way. America is resisting their plans. That's why we are at war right now. The destiny of America hangs in the balance. Will we remain a constitutional republic or align with global socialism? That's the battle. That's the valley of decision. Dad had the word in prayer the other night that uh, is so right on. Joel 3:14. America right now is in the valley of decision. America is facing a day of the Lord in the valley of decision. We are facing that right now. Will we? We're at a crossroads. 
Will we be a constitutional republic or will we align with global socialism? Eric Metaxas, in his book, If You Can Keep It, told this amazing story when the founding fathers in our nation were meeting in Philadelphia and Benjamin Franklin came out and a lady named Miss Powell asked him, Sir, what were you guys doing in there? Were you establishing our, our government? What kind of government are we going to have? A monarchy or a republic? And Benjamin Franklin said to her, a republic if you can keep it. A republic if you can keep it. A government of we the people if you can keep it. A government of the people, by the people, for the people if you can keep it. That is where we are right now. I don't know if the, you know, I don't know if we're going to, you know, I guess the destiny of America is at stake. Can we keep our constitutional republic right now? It's being fought against. We are at war to see the destiny of America, of the people, by the people, for the people. So my question is, and I think it's the, uh, the important question is, what is God's heart in this? And I've been waiting on the Lord and praying about this for some time. And I believe with all of my heart, the Lord himself deeply desires America to remain a constitutional republic. I believe he desires for America to resist the Antichrist government rising up. I believe that we are called to be a nation of refuge in the end times. That's, that, that is the destiny and the heart of God for America right now. Is a, God's heart for America right now is to resist the Antichrist government rising up. God's heart for America right now is to be a, a nation of refuge in the end times. God's heart for America is for America to remain a sending center for missions into the nations. That is literally, I believe with all my heart, it is not the will of God for America to become, be aligned with global socialism. That is the heart of God. And I want to assure us with all my heart, God is in this fight with us. If we will not grow weary, if we will not give in, if we will not just, you know, be, say, oh, it's too bleak, it's too hard. If we will have holy determination, God will be in this fight with us because I believe that's his heart. I believe that's his heart. God is with us in the battle. I've studied the end times for, for 20 plus years. And this, there's this mentality when it comes to the end times that says, well, it's been sovereignly decreed that the Antichrist is going to rule over every nation and all these things are going to happen. And so why fight against what God has already said should happen? Now, let me explain this. There's nowhere in Scripture that says America's fate has already been determined. There are many nations that are going to align with the Antichrist, but it doesn't have to mean every nation will. In fact, if you read in Daniel 11 and 12, you see Egypt and you see uh, Jordan, I believe Jordan, fighting against the Antichrist and he doesn't conquer them. You see resistors fighting. Now, see, a lot of Christians just say, well, it's the sovereign will of God for this to happen. Therefore, I'm not going to fight. That is not scriptural. We are called to resist it in prayer. We're called to minimize its effects. Even in Revelation chapter 18, it says, oh, you saints and prophets and apostles, God has pronounced judgment on her, Babylon, for you. In other words, there was an army of apostles, prophets, and saints rising up in prayer, rising up in Psalms 149, high praises in their mouth, a two-edged sword in their hand, in prayer, pronouncing the written judgments on Babylon, and God brings the answer to their prayer by a judgment that destroys Babylon. We are not called to simply sit back and let the sovereignty of God override this. I do not believe that is scriptural. We are called, God wants his people, even though, listen, even though the, the sovereign part of prophecy is going to be fulfilled. God is not, does not want every single nation to be aligned with it. God wants it to be minimized. 
In other words, God wants us to, I believe God wants us to fight against it, to, in prayer, war against it, that America could be a nation of refuge. You see, that's the battle right now we are in. That's the battle we're in right now. I shared on, on September 13th, 2020, that I believe the Lord is weakening and potentially even shrinking America. And, and I, I shared that this, this slide of, the, of the, the orange is America, the blue is the New World Order, and how at some point for prophecy to be fulfilled, America has to be weakened, the New World Order has to be strengthened. And I believe that's where we are at. I believe no matter the outcome of the election, America, by, by the decree of God, is being weakened. But it does not mean America has to align with the Antichrist and that government of the Antichrist. We can remain a constitutional republic that is a nation of refuge in the end times. Just catch the vision of this for a second. Just catch the vision. The nations around the world are bringing in this great reset. And America says, and again, it's probably not going to happen with all of America. There's probably going to be some states that leave the union for this to happen. I, but I believe this is where we're at. I'm not saying that's, I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't know what that's going to look like. But it is in God's heart. It's in the heart of God for America, even if it was reduced in size, not to align with the Great Reset. That is the battle we are facing. That is the battle we are in right now. Isaiah 8, verse 6. Isaiah 8, verse 6. This is the word the Lord gave me on June 5th, 2020, about what we're facing. I shared it on September the 6th, 2020. And it, it describes for us what was happening in Israel when Assyria was invading. And there was a the northern kingdom of Assyria and the southern kingdom of Judah. And so the, Lord, the word of the Lord to them was this. They have rejected the gentle flowing waters of Shiloh, meaning the Lord himself. And they rejoice, just to make it simple, they rejoice in Assyria. Now therefore, behold, the Lord is about to bring on them the strong and the abundant waters of the Euphrates, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. In other words, because they have, they have rejoiced in the global government of their day, and they like the plans of the global government of their day, God says it's going to come up all the way into your nation. And in fact, it overtook part of the northern kingdom. It will rise up over all its channels and go over all its banks, and it's going to sweep on into Judah. It's going to overflow and pass through. It's going to reach even to the neck. And so Judah was the, the southern kingdom, and that was the part that God preserved. I believe there's a type and shadow of what we're currently facing in terms of God's intention and God's heart for our nation right now. It came up to the back of the neck of Judah. But here's the word of the Lord, and I believe it's the word of the Lord to the remnant in America. Verse 10, devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand. Why? Because God is with us. That's what I want us to see right now. And I want your heart to be filled with encouragement. God is with us in this battle. It's not preacher talk, okay? I'm not just trying to make you feel better. If, we, if there will be a remnant in this nation that will stand against the Great Reset, stand against the corruption and the fraud taking place in this nation, and we'll see justice come. God is with us in the battle. He's the captain of heaven's armies. He controls angels that we could not even count. When Elisha looked up and he saw the, he saw the chariots of God are thousands upon thousands, myriads upon myriads, that is the God we serve. He sits in the heavens and laughs at this. It's easy for him to do something. 
But he's training us in battle. He's training us in war. He's preparing our hands. And I'm talking about, again, spiritual war, just so people are clear. Spiritual warfare, prayer and intercession. He's training us that to fight in the battles. See, listen to what it says. Devise a plan. Well, they've got one called the Great Reset. But it will be thwarted. State a proposal. They've got one, the UN 17 Goals for Sustainable Development. But it will not stand. I think it's going to happen in many nations, but it doesn't have to stand in this country. Why? Because God is with us. God is with us in this battle. God is waging war right now against the, his enemies. God is a mighty warrior, and we need to get on his side. He is the captain of heaven's armies. He's, he's bringing out a sword, just like he did in the days of Joshua. And he's saying, I'm not a Republican, and I'm not a Democrat. I'm captain of heaven's armies. I'm not taking sides. I'm taking over. And he's calling us to ride with him in this battle, to fight with him in this battle, to not give in, not surrender, not quit. I don't care. You know, please replay this back to me next week if things look bad. But, you know, no matter what it looks like, we've got to pray and not lose heart and cry out to God for justice and see what just might happen. Who knows? Who knows what might happen? Jeremiah Johnson, on July the 8th, had a prophetic dream where he saw waters. This was after, he published this after the Lord gave me the word about the water reaching to the back of the neck, where he saw Lady Liberty with water up to about her, her shoulder neck area. This picture shows it right here. And in the dream, he saw that water up to that neck. That's right where we're at right now. We have the water of enemies. Marxist, communist, socialist, globalist who want to destroy America. They are licking their chops right now. They see the defeat of America right now in this election. They see that it's over. But God sits in the heavens and he laughs. God has the final word in this battle we face. The Lord has the final word. And so Jeremiah Johnson saw that, that what happened was there was these, these boats that were like Noah's arks that were around this water, and it was the remnant. And they had a flag that says, Appeal to America, and the American flag, and it was the remnant that saved America. That is where we are right now. It will be, just like in Isaiah's day, the remnant who saved Judah the remnant who saves America. So I just want to say to you, just prepare for the fight. Prepare for the long haul. This thing's not going away in just like a couple weeks. We're in this battle for a while. We've got to rise up in prayer and intercession. We've got to undergird it like we have never prayed before. And we have been praying awesome. We've been, man, praise God for the way we have been praying. Praise God for the way our church has rallied to prayer and intercession. we got to keep it up and even take it higher. Amen? Just to go higher and deeper. I think we need to learn the less, some lessons from Reese Howells, the intercessor. And I, I just read through his book on Friday. Just, you know, like I said, I have these emotional roller coasters. One day I'm up, one day I'm down, one day I'm up, one day I'm down. One minute I'm up, one minute I'm down. You know, I'm sure you probably feel that way. But Reese Howells, and I just read through his, his, uh, his book when he talked about the uh, Battle of Dunkirk and the Battle of Britain in World War II. It was just amazing to see that, you know, they fought through doubt. They fought through unbelief. They fought through like, you know, you know they were in this, this incredibly intense war. Reese Howells even made a prediction that was published in a magazine that he, in faith, he said, God is going to spare Britain from war. It was published in a magazine, and it didn't happen. And so he was like, man, you know, obviously he's confused. He's like, I thought you spoke. I thought you said. But that didn't cause Reese Howells to quit the fight. 
That didn't cause them to say, well, God, I thought God was going to spare us, therefore I'm just going to lay down and let whatever happens, happens. No. He said, I'm going to let the cross work in that because I don't understand it, and through that cross there's going to come a resurrection. And so as I read through these, these chapters, he started talking about the, the importance. I mean, the thing that was repeated over and over and over is the importance of faith in prayer. Vital. Vital. I love what he said here. He said, the Holy, this is written on, uh, it was written on September, the, I think the 9th. I'm not sure of the year, but September the 9th. As the German air raids were coming over Britain, this is what he said, speaking about the prayer meeting from the night before to his team of intercessors. I don't know how many intercessors they had, but it was uh, Wells, I think it was Wells Bible College in Wells. He said, the Holy Spirit has found faith equal to what he wants to do. Oh, that's awesome. I got to read that again. Speaking about the night before, he says, now the Holy Spirit has found faith equal to what he wants to do. That's awesome. That's where we are at right now. Take care you are believing. That would, that would, I'm just going to say it to, every, to us and those who are listening online. I know it's a roller coaster of emotions. I know it looks like this is not going to go the way we want it without a miracle. I know that. But I'm saying take care in how you believe. Watch over your heart. In turn. Don't let unbelief and doubt come in until it's over. Believing is the most delicate thing you can think of. It is like a vapor. You can easily miss it. The victory happened yesterday morning, talking about their, their team. And if you didn't see it, you may never see it. This is what he says. From this time on, he can guide this battle, but he couldn't do it before without faith. That's awesome. Well, what happened? What happened six days later? The German air raids are coming over Britain. Everything seems as if it's lost. Churchill goes into the meeting rooms to look to into the, the operations room of the Royal Air Force. And he says, okay, how many, how many reserves do we have in this fight? And they said, we don't have any more left. It was said of Churchill, his face became grave because he knew the battle was over. If that air raid would have been successful, the Germans then could have invaded Britain and they could very well be speaking German today. But for some unknown reason, but we know the reason, yes. Reese Howells and his team of intercessors, because they gained the victory by faith, for some unknown reason, five minutes later, the Germans started flying back home. No one knows why. Five minutes later after that, the entire air raid had ended. And they're like, what happened? We know what happened. After the war, Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding, an officer in the RAF fighter command of the Battle of Britain, said, even during the battle, one realized from day to day how much external support was coming in. At the end of the battle, one had the sort of feeling that there had been some special divine intervention to alter some sequence of events which would otherwise have occurred. Praise God. Praise God. Now, they, that didn't mean the war was over, but that battle meant the Germans did not invade Britain. If God can do it then, why not now? If God can do it then, why not today? Why not fight for the destiny of America? Why not contend for what God's original intention was for this nation? A city set on the hill, a city where the gospel could go out into the nations. A city of justice, a city of truth. 
Why not now? How come it can't happen? It can happen. God is with us in the battle. God is with us in the fight. He just needs a few, a remnant of people who will do the crazy thing that it seems that it is to simply believe God is big enough to do what he wants to do. Amen. Don't allow unbelief to get in. Don't allow doubt to get in. Even if it doesn't go our way in this election, the battle, that is just not, the battle's not over. We're in this for, we're in this for a while. I don't know how long. I don't know how long the battle is. I, I don't, I don't. Until. That's right. Until. I believe this time we are in could be a second American revolution. This time is just as historic as the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. At stake is whether America remains a constitutional republic or aligns with the Antichrist government that is rising up. And I've read stories, man, I've read stories of God's providence in the Revolutionary War, where everything, I mean, it was David and Goliath like you can never imagine. And everything seemed as if they were going to lose, but God, divine, what they would call divine providence stepped in. There's some divine providence, I believe, is about to be released if we will can keep praying and not lose heart. Keep crying out for justice and not quit. I've read the, the stories of God's intervention in the Arab-Israeli wars of 48 and 67 where God supernaturally, you know, supernaturally rose up to defend his, his beloved nation. Listen, I don't know how this is going to end. I don't. But I believe God is not finished with America. God is not finished with America. And we shouldn't be either. I believe with all my heart God is going to get into this battle we are involved with. No matter how bleak it seems, God is able. Now let's, let's turn to Daniel chapter 3 verse 17. This to me is, a, is, is such a great uh, verse of scripture for the, the, the battle that we are facing. And this was the time when Daniel was about to be thrown into the fire. Or Shadrach, or was it maybe Shadrach, Meshach, no, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were about to be thrown into the fire. And they said, if it be so, our God whom we serve, and I'm going to, let me just take it like this. I'm going to take it and just apply it into our current situation as we're praying for the nation of America. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from this attack that's coming upon our nation. He's able to deliver us from the voter fraud that has taken place. He's able to deliver us from the conspiracy that has been released to destroy our constitution and bring us into the great reset. God is able. And now look, look what it says. He's able to deliver us. And I love this. And he will deliver us. Oh, we need that in our, our lips right now. God will deliver us. I don't know how. I do not know the way it's going to work. I do not know what it's going to look like. God is going to deliver America. God is going to save America. God is not done with America yet. He will save this nation, even if it's like Lazarus. And he's dead for four days. And it looks all, all hope is lost. If you will believe, you will see the glory of God. God is able to raise America up out from the dead. He will deliver America. He will deliver America. He will deliver America. He will deliver America. He will, he will, he will, he will. Let that faith rise up in our hearts right now. He will deliver America. But if for some mysterious reason he does not, verse 18, let it be known to you, he is God. 
That's not going to shake our faith in who he is. If there's some mystery for why he doesn't, if there's some thing we don't understand of why he doesn't answer the way we hoped or thought or pleaded with, let it be known that we are going to worship him and him alone. He is God. He's still God. He sits on the throne and he is worthy of all of our praise. Amen. That is the response we are to take, I believe, in this battle. See, right now, I would rather have the faith of a child and be proven wrong than have the unbelief of a cynic and be proven right. Let me say that again. Faith looks, okay, faith looks foolish. Abraham, in hope against hope, he believed. It looked foolish. He was impotent. It looked foolish. I would rather go down fighting with the faith of a child and be proven wrong than to have the unbelief of a cynic and be proven right. Let's not lose our faith. Let's have that faith of a child to believe that God is able, that God is able. See, Joel 2.14 says, who knows what God might do? If we pray, if we fast, if we stand in the gap, spare this nation, spare this people, who knows what God will do? We don't, we simply don't know what God is going to do. Don't quit. Don't, don't grow weary in the battle. Do not quit. Do not stop praying. Do not stop interceding for this nation. So listen to what Terry said when he was here a few weeks ago. He said, so pray. this is the, the word of the Lord that was given to Terry. So pray for my servant, Donald Trump. Listen to the condition of it, though. For if you will stand for my purposes in the United States, it's not just talking about us, it's talking about the, the body of Christ in this nation, and act accordingly, you will be joyfully surprised in your deliverance amid my toppling of powers within and great evils amid my judgments. Let me read it one more time. So pray for my servant, Donald Trump. For if you will stand for my purposes in the United States and act accordingly, you will be joyfully surprised in your deliverance. What, did I just, what do I just read from Daniel? God will deliver. God will deliver. Amid my toppling of powers within we're talking about great, great corruption in America. We're talking about if this thing goes down and God gets involved, my goodness, let's believe it. That's the will of God, I believe, with all my heart. Let's fight for it in prayer and in intercession. Within and great evils amid my judgments. Now the question is, quoting from Reese Howells, Will the Holy Spirit find faith equal to the task he wants to do? That's probably where it challenges most of us, right? Do we have the faith? I mean, it seems, I totally understand. It seems crazy what I'm saying. And please me, it feels really crazy speaking it. Do we have the faith to believe that God really can drain the swamp? Because the Lord is looking, the Holy Spirit is looking for faith equal to the task. Believing prayer for God to move. Amen. Will you be one of those intercessors that says, Holy Spirit, develop in me the faith equal 
to the task. Well, you might be one of the one of the very few who are still believing. You might be looked upon as foolish. That's okay. It's not about our reputation. Your friends, your family might think you're crazy. That's okay. It's not about that right now. We will believe. We will have faith equal to the task of what God wants to do. Amen.